Welcome to this online lesson which will serve as an overview of the medical renaissance, especially for revision purposes. The aims of this lesson are to review the key themes of renaissance medicine, to reach judgments about the extent of progress in the medical renaissance, and here's a do now task to get you started. All of these pictures relate to the medical renaissance in some way. Your do now task is to note down what examples of renaissance medicine are related to these different pictures. Pause the video while you complete that task and then we'll go through some answers. Done? Well this is what you should have identified. The first picture relates to the tools of the barber surgeon. Little change from the tools of the medieval barber surgeon. The next is all about William Harvey and his theory of blood circulation. This is the test that he could do on live people to show that there were valves within the blood allowing the blood to only, uh, valves within the blood vessels I should say, allowing the blood to only move in one direction. This is Andreas Vesalius, he's studying a cadaver or dead human body as part of his work to produce fabric of the human body. This is a plague doctor related to the Great Plague of 1665. And this is Thomas Sydenham, the so-called English Hippocrates. Today's lesson looks at a revision activity. You may already have your own preferred way of revising, but I'm going to make two key suggestions for today. Firstly, a mind map or revision cards. These are sometimes referred to as index or flashcards. Your task will be to use whichever technique you think works best. We'll have a look at some examples of how you will do these, but there will be sections on theories about the cause of illness during the Renaissance, treatment and prevention of illness during the Renaissance, surgery, understanding of the body, significant events and individuals. In addition, for each subtopic, you will need to decide if this represents mostly progress or mostly continuity. So are things getting better in medical understanding and knowledge or are they staying broadly the same? Option number one is a mind map. Here's how you can lay it out. Firstly, your title in the middle should be Progress and Continuity in Renaissance Medicine. You could have a section on the cause of disease, treatment and prevention of disease, surgery, understanding the body, and significant events and individuals. And again, each time we're asking whether there is more progress or more continuity. Notice that I've given each section its own dedicated colour. Another good way of doing this, especially if you're doing it by hand, is by having lots of wavy branches rather than straight lines as I've shown here. That will allow you to be more free in the shapes that you draw and also it's a good idea to double encode this sort of thing with basic illustrations. You don't have to be a great artist, it just helps embed it into your long-term memory. Nevertheless, here's some examples of what you might include as some of your notes. Again, I've colour coded these. So people still believed in the theory of the four humours. That's an example of continuity. Notice how I've given the fact and also I indicated that that specific example is an example of continuity. You can then decide at the end whether that particular factor overall represents more pro progress or more continuity. Here's another. Andreas Vesalius produced fabric of the human body. That would be an example of progress. What you're going to see during the course of this lesson is a whole load of screens uh, which will relate to different information that you could place around this diagram in various locations. I won't be giving you much help as to where to place your information. That's going to be the extra le level of analysis and thinking that you're going to have to do for yourself. So just be prepared for that. Also, if you've seen some of my other videos in this uh, series on the Renaissance, then you will recognise a lot of this content from there. I've given it new narration, but it's not necessarily going to add anything new if you've already done this task before. So this could always be a revision activity done from memory rather than from this video. Nevertheless, there will be an exam practice activity at the end of the lesson which you might want to skip forward to once you're happy with your revision notes. So that's option one. Option two are the revision cards. Here's how they might look. On the one side, you will have the overall heading of that particular factor. Here I've chosen significant events and individuals, progress or continuity. Then you can turn over the card and this is where you put your facts. Just bear in mind though that the cards might need to be a reasonable size if they're going to be very detailed or you might need to have uh, several kind of sub cards within each section to make sure you get all the necessary detail down. So underneath significant events and individuals I might have, for example, although you'll want more than this, Andreas Vesalius produced fabric of the human body which had accurate uh, diagrams of anatomy. William Harvey demonstrated that, that blood circulates in the body using ex experiments on frogs. 
and in 1665 the plague broke out, out in London that was known as the Great Plague. Uh, with Vesalius and Harvey that represents progress the Great Plague actually really represents continuity for the most part with the understanding that existed at the time of the Black Death. So that's your second option for producing a revision resource. By all means choose which one you think will be most effective or if you're not sure give both of them a try. We're now going to have a look at the different factors that relate to Renaissance medicine. You can pause at each section when the information is up on the screen, consider the questions and then add relevant notes to the outside of your diagram. As I've said before that these will be familiar content to anyone who's seen some of my other videos but after all this is supposed to be a revision activity so you might well expect that. Once you're happy that you've got all the information that you need from that particular screen press play and we'll move on again. First of all we're going to have a look at Renaissance art. Here's an example of medieval art a fairly unrealistically drawn picture of the Virgin Mary and the infant Christ and the, uh, the human body is not necessarily uh, depicted particularly realistically there. Source 2 is a much more famous painting by Botticelli uh, which is typical of Renaissance art showing a large amount of realism in terms of the representation of the human body even if the scene itself is not especially realistic. So in Source 1 what clues does it show that Giotto did not study the human body to paint his pictures? Two, which clues in source two show that Botticelli did study the human body in much greater anatomical detail. And thirdly, how did the artists who study the human body closely help doctors? That will be related to our studies on Vesalius, which you may have done as well. Anyway, whether you're going to answer those questions or whether you're simply going to add information to your mind map or revision cards, now is your chance. Add notes to your revision activity and only add details relevant to medicine. And that's an important point to make. Pause the video while you complete your notes on this first section. Done? Let's move on to the next. Next up, the importance of science. Renaissance was a time of great discovery. Galileo used telescopes to learn about the planets and help prove that the Earth orbits the Sun and not the other way around. Leonardo da Vinci was not only an amazing artist, he also did some uh, very artistic representations of the human body which were accurate. Uh, he also came up with new and modern ideas, even if he had no way of building them. These included things like the tank and helicopter. Science now used experiments and records to prove new ideas. So how might the desire to find new discoveries challenge the old ideas of Galen and Hippocrates? Let's have a look at this information. Add notes to your revision activity and remember, particularly only add notes to the relevant sections on medicine, not the other things. So be selective with what you note down here. Pause the video while you complete this section. On to the next. Now we'll consider the role of technology. The Renaissance saw the invention of the printing press. This allowed books to be made more quickly, accurately and cheaper, cheaper than ever before. Even pictures could be engraved and printed, like the example from Vesalius' Fabric of the Human Body, which I've included at the bottom of this screen. Do not underestimate the importance of the printing press in making knowledge more accurate and more accessible than it had ever been at any other time in human history. So why would cheaper, more widely made books help medical progress? There's something to consider. Also, new weapons like guns are invented too. How might they help medicine? You might have already, already done some work on Pare. If not, there will be some notes on him later on in this presentation. So add some more notes to your revision activity. Again, only add details relevant to medical understanding. Pause the video while you do this. Okay, let's move on to the next section on technology. Here we see an engraving of a Renaissance water pump. Relationships were seen between the way that the water pump worked and the way that certain parts of the body worked. So some connections with technology were rather more indirect. So add notes to your revision activity as we go through this. Again, only adding details relevant to medicine. Other developments had an impact too, indirectly. Water pumps had been developed. This might have contributed to later ideas about the circulation of the blood. William Harvey may have drawn inspiration from certain uh, machines like this, which would have been modern in his time. Compare the diagram of the water pump with this diagram of the human heart. It would have been recognised that much as the pump has got different uh, uh, chambers for pumping different parts of a garden, so might this uh, heart have got different chambers for diff pumping different blood to different parts of the body. But it would have been circular as many uh, water pumps were at the time as well. Add notes to your revision activity now. Now 
Next, Renaissance religion. Here we can see an engraving or illustration of a human dissection. This was something that was forbidden by religion for much of the Middle Ages and for some of the Renaissance too. However, it was an incredibly important development for overturning some of the wrong ideas that had existed, particularly those of Galen. As in the Middle Ages, the church controlled much of knowledge in the Renaissance. This meant that some new ideas were stopped, and this held medicine back. But new religious ideas were challenging this control. Protestants, for example, were bringing new ideas to religion. From the 1400s onwards, the church no longer banned or discouraged human dissections, allowing people to learn more about the body, and that Galen had got some things wrong. In particular, it was considered okay to dissect the bodies of uh, executed criminals. This is something that, as we'll see later, Vesalius was able to take advantage of. So, add some more notes to your revision activity now, adding in particular notes that are relevant to medicine. And don't forget, by this point, you should be able to build up a bit of a picture as to whether there's more progress or more continuity. Label each of your facts with either progress or continuity. Pause the video while you complete this section, and then we'll move on. Ready to go? All right. Renaissance surgery, change and continuity. A reminder of the tools of the trade when it comes to surgery. You can see them there. I'm now gonna to describe to you the process of a uh, Renaissance amputation. Here in the illustration, we can see the barber surgeon at work as a battlefield um, a surgeon. This is a sort of work that people like Ambrose Pare would have done. Firstly, the patient was not anaesthetized although they may have been hit over the head and given some alcohol, though not for the amputations, where this was recognised to thin the blood and uh, encourage bleeding. It may just be, in many cases, that they were given a simple wooden block or a strap of leather to bite down on. In the case of this person here, he's not actually anaesthetised, he simply fainted. Next, the surgeon would not take precautions to prevent infection. Infection was not understood at this time, and so there would have been no need uh, to prevent infection in the minds of the barber surgeon. The cause of infection remained unknown. The first part of the uh, operation is being quick. Speed was key. The main causes of death were pain, infection, blood loss and shock. Speed helped with the pain and the shock. The patient would be held down and a rope or cord tourniquet would be turned, um, tied around the limb to be removed. This would restrict the blood flow to that limb and stop the patient bleeding out so easily. The surgeon would start the uh, incision by cutting a deep uh, cut right the way down to the bone in one swift movement using the curved knife. The flesh would be pulled back to reveal the bone and the surgeon quickly saw through the bone removing the limb. The pullback flesh would then be stretched back over the bone to form a stump. Blood would still be pouring out all over the surgeon's apron. And in fact, having a filthy apron was a sign of pride for the barber surgeon. It showed people that this wasn't their first operation and that they could actually be trusted. However, this would have increased the risk of infection. The wound would then be cauterized by hot irons. By the end of the Renaissance, people like Pare were using ligatures to tie up the blood vessels. And it appears that's what's being done in this, uh, this particular illustration. However, these ligatures still spread infection and it was not understood how. So cauterization remained quite common. The stump would be wrapped with bandages to soak up any remaining blood. Only then could the tourniquet, tourniquet be cautiously removed, although it had to be reapplied if the bleeding persisted. The patient would be left to recover after that. Success was only about 50-50, with infection from unwashed tools common, as was shock and loss of blood. So you need to make some more notes uh, on your mind maps now or on your revision cards. If you need to replay this section again, then by all means do so. But remember this is revision. Hopefully you've got some useful notes and some existing knowledge that you can add on to it. Pause the video while you add the notes that you need and then press play when you're ready to see the next section. Once you've got sufficient notes on, on the Renaissance surgery, consider this. Both Renaissance and medieval barber surgeons use the same tools. And does it show progression or regression or continuity that surgery remained the same? Explain why. You will need to indicate this on your revision activity. For much of the Renaissance, there was continuity in surgery. Understanding about the cause of infection remained unknown. So remember, this is not just information for your section on surgery, but also on the cause and treatment of disease. Effective anaesthetics remained a mystery at this time, and surgeons remained unqualified. 
except for perhaps having a license from the church. Cutting bits of the body off, however, might require pretty much the same kit as it had ever done. OK, pause the video again and make any remaining notes that you need to on this section. Press play when you're ready to go on. Onwards. This is going to be a rather more detailed slide, so you might need to put this full screen if you're going to read the text clearly. So these facts can go in various places on your cards or on your mind map. Make appropriate notes and consider whether they represent progress or continuity. I'll leave that up to you. Firstly, there were still very few trained doctors around. Herbal remedies worked and therefore they encouraged people to keep the old ways of treating illness. The church was still very powerful and people were told that God controlled every aspect of life, including illness. That's the first three of 12. You can pause the video here and begin making your notes or you can wait until they're all displayed. On to the next three. Governments and kings did not believe it was their job to try and make people healthier or to keep the towns cleaner unless there were big outbreaks of plague, such as in 1665, of course. Wise women would often be the first person you consulted if you were ill, especially in the countryside. And there was still a belief in the power of the supernatural to make you ill. There's the next three, you can pause or we'll just carry on. The work of Galen and other ancient healers was still an important part of medical training for doctors. Ideas about what had caused disease were often the same in the Renaissance as they were in the Middle Ages. And doctors had believed for so long in the accuracy of Galen that it was very hard to change many people's views. Last section. Apothecaries were still used. Remember, these were the people who mixed up different medicines, sometimes on the uh, instructions of a physician, though they were often not. Bleeding was still a very popular treatment, which was related to physicians still believing in the idea of the four humours. OK. That's that for the, this section. Pause the video while you added the appropriate notes to your mind map or to your cards and press play when you're ready to continue. Don't forget to indicate whether each example represents progress or continuity. The illness and death of Charles II. I've got a more full lesson of this where we look at uh, the work of Thomas Sydenham and causes and cures in Renaissance times in general. But here's a summary. Hippocrates still had his ideas believed in the time of the illness of Charles II, and this film formed the basis of much of the teaching of his doctors. So they did use the ideas of Hippocrates. Clinical observation and diagnosis remained important. The doctors recorded the king's tr uh, treatments and symptoms over time in detail. Unsuccessfully, though. Also, they believed in the theory of the four humours. Many of the treatments, such as bleeding, blistering and purging, were based on balancing the humours. Also, they believed in the work of Galen. The theory of opposites. Some of the treatments such as pigeon droppings may have been intended to draw out poisons through the use of opposites and fighting miasma with strong smells. If you can't remember what I'm referring to there, at one stage of Charles II's illness a treatment was suggested where pigeon droppings were rubbed over the soles of his feet. Nice. Also herbal and traditional medicines were used. Galen agreed with these sorts of things but also there was a lot of common sense involved with that. And the use of apothecaries. There were some really expensive and exotic quack medicines that were provided to Charles II. Exotic medicines with quack ingredients like human skull and bezoa stone are typical of apothecary mixtures of the time. This should give you some ideas for how treat, uh, the cause of disease was believed and also the treatments that were tried. So add some more notes to your revision activity and be clear again. Does this represent continuity with the Middle Ages or progress? Pause the video while you complete that. All right, let's move on. Some doctors did build on these ancient ideas of Hippocrates though. Thomas Sydenham was alive actually before the time of Charles II and it's possibly a shame for Charles II's sake, but he wasn't around uh, on the day of his death. Thomas Sydenham became known as the English Hippocrates. He trained at Oxford University, but the Civil War cut his studies short. This was possibly a good thing because it meant that he would have been less influenced by the teaching of many of these old ideas and he would not have been told quite so strongly that he should not question them. Sidham decided that each disease that people could get was different and therefore it needed to be individually identified. Following on from this, each disease also required a different cure in order to work. 
believed in, he also believed in the theory of observation and diagnosis, which had been pioneered by Hippocrates. And he also believed in letting nature take its course, observing the patient rather than constantly intervening. So they let nature take its course with an illness rather than trying every other cure at random, as had happened with the death of Charles II. He encouraged the taking of the pulse as a method of diagnosis, recognising the relationship between a fast or slow pulse in relation to the severity of illness. He wrote a book with his findings called Observations Medicae in 1676, which was printed and widely shared. He also discovered particular diseases such as Sydenham's cholera and showed the difference between scarlet fever and measles, two diseases with similar presentations and symptoms which people would often confuse. He also did not believe that God caused disease, only that God gave the people the ability to recognise it and fight it. This encouraged people to actually try and fight illness rather than just leaving it up to God, prayer, or just saying this is God's will, it is not up for us to change it. So, add some more notes to your revision activity now. Again, indicate whether Sydenham's work represents progress or continuity. There are aspects of both. Pause the video while you do this. On to the next. What about the beginnings of the Enlightenment and the Royal Society? In 1660, the Royal Society for, of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, which is now better known simply as the Royal Society, was set up. This was a sign that the King was supporting the developments of new scientific ideas. Scientists would discuss new ideas in science and medicine and challenge old ideas. Increasingly in the Renaissance, it was fashionable for rulers to be supporters of the sciences and to show an inquiring mind. This was particularly helpful to some of our later um, historical uh, figures. We've already seen how Sydenham was a doctor to Charles I and James I, and significant individuals and influential people will also help Vesalius, Paré and Harvey, which we'll look at later. So the Royal Society would carry out experiments and also use new technology like microscopes. The Royal Society's findings were widely published in printed books and journals. The Age of Enlightenment, where people felt free to question religious explanations for scientific ideas, was about to begin. Again, add some new notes to your revision activity, indicate whether these represent progress or continuity. We're now going to have a review of three of the big individuals from Renaissance medicine, starting with Andreas Vesalius, born 1514, died 1564. Andreas Vesalius made great advances in the understanding of anatomy, the structure of the human body. He's pictured here examining a cadaver. Before Vesalius, Galen's work on anatomy had been accepted without question. However, Galen was only able to dissect animals and made several mistakes. In 1537, Vesalius became professor of medicine at Padua University in Italy. He insisted that his medical students should perform human dissections to better understand how the body worked. Human dissection was still usually illegal, but a local judge gave Vesalius permission to dissect bodies of executed criminals. He could do this regularly. After all, there were plenty of people executed for crimes back then. In 1543, Vesalius wrote his book, The Fabric of the Human Body. This contained accurate drawings of the human body drawn by artists. These gave doctors more detailed knowledge of human anatomy based on real human dissections. Using printing technology, this book was widely seen. This meant that Vesalius had proved some of Galen's work was wrong. He also encouraged others to challenge old ways of thinking. Add some more notes to your revision activity. Again, which represent continuity, which represent progress. Pause the video while you complete this. On to our next individual. Ambrose Paré, 1510 to 1590. Paré was a battlefield surgeon who changed the way wounds were treated, despite having no more training than most other barber surgeons. In Paré's career, gunshot wounds became a new challenge for surgeons. The usual way to treat these was by pouring boring, boiling oil into the wound to cauterise it in the, and in the belief that bullets were poisonous and the boiling oil would counteract this. In fact, they were not poisonous, it was more that these wounds were becoming infected as the bullets would take in filthy bits of clothing, for example. After one battle, Pari had so many wounds to treat that he ran out of oil, boiling oil. By chance and out of desperation, he made an ointment of egg yolk, oil of roses and turpentine that he had read that the Romans used to treat wounds. Pari did not expect this to work, however he was in for a pleasant surprise. The ointment had worked. Those treated with it healed more quickly. 
Poiré recommended that it should be used in future in preference to the boiling oil. He went on to become surgeon to the French royalty and was supported by the kings of France. He also attempted to reduce the pain and shock of amputations. He used silk threads called ligatures to tie off blood vessels. This worked. Death rates were no, no better though. Pari was unaware of how this method caused infection through dirt. Indeed, his ointment of egg yolk, oil of roses and turpentine had largely fairly sterile ingredients for the time which would have really helped them and made them more soothing. Indeed, turpentine would have acted as an early, early form of antiseptic. Not that Pari would have understood this. In 1575, the printing press allowed his book, The Collected Works of Ambrose Pare, to teach other surgeons new methods. He also pioneered prosthetic or fake limbs to help disabled amputees. Add some more notes to your revision activity now. Again, what's progressed and what's continuity? On to our last one. William Harvey, born 1578, died 1657. William Harvey was an English doctor. He was the personal physician of both James I and Charles I. Both kings encouraged his scientific investigations. Like Vesalius, he was trained at Padua University. Harvey was able to demonstrate and prove the circulation of the blood. This went against Galen's theory that the liver made blood which was then used up like a fuel in the muscles. Also like Vesalius, he taught about anatomy. He dissected animals and carried out experiments to prove his ideas. For example, he dissected live frogs. Frogs, when cold, have a very slow heartbeat, which allowed Harvey to clearly see the circulation of the blood and demonstrate it. He also showed that blood could only flow in one direction because of the valves in blood vessels. He had proved Galen wrong. In 1628, he was able to publish his findings in An Anatomical Account of the Motion of the Heart and Blood in Animals. In this book, he proved that the heart acted like a pump and was responsible for the recirculating of the blood around the body. Printing allowed the book to be widely shared. Now, add some more notes to your revision activity. Press pause while you do this and press play when you're ready to move on. The Great Plague of 1665. This is probably the most significant single event that you'll study as part of the Renaissance. To try and beat the plague, the Lord Mayor of London created orders that people had to follow. These were that jobs were given to people to be in charge of street cleaning and rubbish collection. Large groups of people were not allowed to meet up. Deaths had to be recorded, infected houses had to be closed up and marked with a cross and closed for 40 days until either the person was better or dead. This is a form of quarantine, the French word quarant meaning 40. Although in reality, just saying 40 days back at this time actually really just meant for a long time. Beggars were arrested, plague doctors were appointed to report cases of sickness, rakers cleared away sewage and threw it into the river, bonfires were lit on street corners, Watchers guarded infected houses by day and night, and female searchers carrying staffs, big sticks, uh, examined the dead for signs of plague. Public entertainments had to be stopped. Dogs, cats, pigeons and pigs were banned from the streets and killed. For example, 40,000 dogs were killed during the plague. This probably didn't do any good whatsoever though. The dogs and cats probably would have helped control the rat population that was causing the plague in the first place. And lastly, bodies were uh, supposed to be buried after dark. Consider these different factors. What do they relate to? And also, what re uh, med medical ideas do they relate to? Add appropriate notes to your revision activity and consider, do these represent progress from the Middle Ages or more continuity? You might want to think of this in relation to what you've already understood about the Black Death in the Middle Ages. Here's another activity so you can add even more about the understanding of the cause and spread of disease. These were the common beliefs and causes that people believed at the time. God's punishment, bad air or miasma, contact with the dead and diseased, cats and dogs spreading the disease. In this picture we can see some of these illustrated. Again, you might want to use these as inspiration for some illustrations on your mind map or on your cards. Prayer was used as a way of fighting infection, although the effectiveness of this was really down to faith. Bonfires and burning tar were lit to get rid of the bad air. It wasn't about making a nicer smelling environment, it was about just replacing one bad smell with another stronger smell. Taking the dead to bury them outside the city was considered effective. Marking houses, this prevented people going in and clashing the plague. Spreading news of the plague by word of mouth. Leaving the city, although only the rich could afford this if they had a second home. And killing cats and dogs, they were thought to spread the plague. 
Ironically, actually, the rats were caught by the, the cats and dogs, and this probably made matters worse. Okay, pause the video here, add notes to your mind map or your cards, and press play when you're ready to continue. Again, be thinking whether these factors represent change or continuity. Now consider the example of the Plague Doctor again. The Plague Doctor wore a beak of sweet-smelling herbs to combat the bad air or miasma theory, a stick to ward off victims and to check the dead to maintain a social distance from them, heavy gloves to stop contact with the victims, and a long coat to prevent contact with bad air and the victims again. Similarly, they wore a mask to protect the Doctor from bad air as well. A reminder of some of the common beliefs of the time. So, based upon this diagram of the Plague Doctor and the measures taken, add some notes to your revision activity. Which of these measures represents really an understanding of continuity between the cause of disease that was believed in the Middle Ages and that of the Renaissance? Or are there any examples of progress? Make your notes now and pause the video while you do so. Hopefully you've got some really detailed revision notes now, whether it's on your cards or whether it's on your mind map. If not, go back and make sure that you do complete this first. For this activity, you may choose to use your notes to assist you while you're writing up your answer, or you may choose to give yourself the extra challenge of trying to do this from memory, as you will have to do in the exam. Also, if you've skipped the creation of the revision sessions because you've already looked at these things, or if you didn't feel that you needed to, this is a good opportunity to practice some revision techniques now. Here is an exam question, a 16 mark answer, which will require a structured essay to answer. There was little progress in standards of health from the end of the Middle Ages to the end of the Renaissance. How far do you agree with this view? Explain your answer. With this question, I recommend that you actually write it down because there's some fairly important points to this. In the exam, you'll also be given some stimulus material to help you with the knowledge. You may use the following in your answer. In other words, you could use these things and it would be a good idea to, but you don't have to. The impact of individuals. I've given you a couple of clues on screen there. The understanding of the cause of disease. Now, it also says you must also use information of your own. There are six marks in total just for your detailed historical knowledge in this question. Therefore, if you do not include any examples that go beyond the impact of individuals and the understanding of the cause of disease, you cannot pick up all six of those marks. Let's just return to the top part of the question again. There was little progress in standards of health from the end of the Middle Ages to the end of the Renaissance. Health is not the same thing as medical understanding. It's about how likely people are to get to a disease and how likely they are to die from it, as well as things like life expectancy. So do not fall into the trap of thinking that necessarily the role of individuals always had a big impact on how healthy people were. Not necessarily true. It might just be that it had a big impact on what people understood about disease. So you could have a go at answering this now. You'd want to spend about 25 to 30 minutes on this unless you're entitled to extra time in the exam. However, if you want a little bit more help into how to structure your answer and give, get some sentence starters, that's what we're going to have a look at now. If you'd prefer not to use these, pause the video here and commence your answer. If not, here's the, uh, the basic pointers. I suggest the use of PEEL paragraphs. This stands for Point, Example, Explain and Link. You need your first argument first of all. In some ways there was little progress in standards of health during the Renaissance. And this is where you're going to give some examples of ways in which health didn't really improve that much. These are examples of continuity. So have a look on your mind map or your cards for that. An example of this was, the effect of this was or this involved, and this supports the view that there was little progress in the Renaissance because then, as an extra challenge, you could evaluate this. You could say whether or not you agree with that particular point of view, or you could give some sort of counter-argument to it. And then you actually bring in your main counter-argument. We've just been over the ways that there were, in fact, very few uh, examples of progress in health. We're now going to try and include some examples of where health did improve. So, on the other hand, there was also progress in medicine. Phrases like, on the other hand, are really crucial here. And look as well at how I've structured the link sentences. This supports the view that there was little progress, actually relates to the wording of the question and makes it really clearly that you're tying your answer back to that question. Once you finish your counter argument and another couple of examples will be good for here as a minimum, you can continue as above 
And then when you've done that paragraph, you can conclude overall. Again, you'll need to support this with other examples and other thinking, and you may indeed uh, summarise some of the examples you've already given. And that's usually a good idea, because it shows how you can relate to your uh, examples that you've employed to support your opinion. All right, that's all the advice I'm going to be able to give you for now. So pause the video and give yourself between 25 and 30 minutes to complete that answer. Your hand should be aching by the end of it. Good luck. Here's an example answer. I've highlighted my point, example, explanations, links and evaluations in these different colours, just for the sake of clarity. You'll notice that the text is rather small. This is necessary to fit this long answer on one screen, which I'm going to attempt to do. If you can't read this, make sure that you're watching the video in high definition, and also I'd recommend that you make it full screen. In some ways, there was little progress in medicine in the Renaissance, so this is the first argument which is going in favour of the statement. For example, there had been very little progress in the understanding of the cause and treatment of disease. The most commonly held beliefs remained the ancient ideas of the four humours and the belief in the theory of miasma. This supports the view that there was little progress because treatments such as bleeding were still the best that medical science could offer. Similarly, responses to the Great Plague of 1665 differed little from the back death, with fires to clear the miasma being used to try to prevent infection and prayer being relied upon. Another example was that surgery had not progressed very much either. The barber surgeon still had little training and worked with very similar equipment and with few ways to fight infection, pain or blood loss. This supports the view that there was little progress as barber surgeons operated in a similar way to in the Middle Ages. However, there have been some developments in surgery. Ambrose Pare developed the use of ligatures instead of cauterisation. That said, this did not improve death rates as Pare could not understand the role that ligatures played in causing infection. Just to pause briefly, that last section of evaluation is beginning to build in my argument here. So I am really going to be arguing that there was indeed very little progress. So although I've recognised that there were examples of progress in surgery, I'm then also acknowledging that those bits of progress really didn't improve health, which is the nature of the question. Now the counter-argument. On the other hand, there was some significant progress in the Renaissance. For example, the work of key individuals could be spread more accurately and widely through the invention of the printing press. This resulted in the, uh, the books ri written by Vesalius, Pare, Harvey and Sydenham being widely shared and read. This challenges the view that there was little progress as, for example, doctors like Harvey could benefit from the earlier work of Vesalius when studying anatomy, leading to breakthroughs in the, uh, like the demonstration that blood circulates in the body. Now for my evaluation again, this is really crucial because it's most of these things that I've put in this paragraph so far have not been directly related to health. However, although this was an important example of progress in terms of medical knowledge, it had almost no impact on health, limiting the amount of progress it represents. Also, the work of Thomas Sydenham made doctors more effective. Sydenham revived some of Hippocrates' theories and identified that each disease had a unique cause and would therefore require its own unique and natural remedy, rather than a religious remedy. This challenges the view that there was little progress, as this changed the ways that, that doctors diagnosed illness in, in their patients. However, this also represents only limited progress, as although the approach was better, the treatment of Charles II shows that treatments of disease still relied on ancient ideas like the four humours and with bleeding and purgatives still widely used. Okay, again, that evaluation is showing that although there was a little bit of progress in certain areas, the actual issue identified in the question is one of medical progress in relation to health. And it's again demonstrating that these, this progress didn't really improve health. Right, the answer's getting pretty long now, but I'm still not finished. Let's look at the conclusion. In conclusion, I agree to a fairly large extent that there was little progress in medicine in the Renaissance. Harvey and Pare made significant advances in physiology and surgery, and Vesalius made advances in the understanding of anatomy. Just to go back to the point for a moment, notice that I said I agree to a fairly large extent. The question was asking you, to what extent do you agree? So think about the phrase that you'll use here. It's unlikely that you're just going to agree or that you're just going to disagree. You should be agreeing to an extent, either a large extent, a small extent or whatever. However, these discoveries did little to improve the understanding and treatment of disease, which still relied on much older ideas because of the cause of disease was still not understood. This supports the view that there was little progress, as although advances in knowledge were important, they would not yet have had a large impact on health as a whole. There was certainly more progress in the Renaissance than there had been in the Middle Ages, with the power of the church being challenged in particular. But it would be some time yet before medicine would advance enough to bring significant improvements in health. 
So there is the answer in its entirety. And yes, it is pretty massive. Again, I hope that you can read that text all right. And I do recommend that you watch this in HD or full screen if you're going to use this. Pause the video on this screen if you want to make some adjustments to your own answer and if you want to add some new knowledge or add some different bits of technique, particularly some of those more challenging sections like the purple links and the black bits of evaluation. You may also want to have included an introduction at the start where you lay out your argument right away. That's fine and it can be a really good idea. It would have taken up a little bit too much space for me to do that. But the other risk with that is what if you say one thing in your introduction and then you say the entirely opposite thing because you convince yourself of another opinion in the conclusion. That's just something to be a little bit careful of if you're going to include an introduction where you lay out your opinion straight away. Anyway, pause the video here if you want to make some notes on this and make some improvements. Finally, you should by now have created either a mind map or a set of revision cards or index cards. This should have enabled you to complete an example 16 mark answer. So let's have a quick reflection. Did the medical renaissance represent mostly progress or mostly continuity? Here's your final task. Write a very brief summary of the extent of medical progress in the renaissance. Pause the video while you do this and just make it a sentence or two long. All right, whatever you've come up with, consider whether or not you agree with my summary, which is as follows. The medical renaissance represented significant progress in the understanding of anatomy, modest progress in surgery, and continuity in the understanding of the cause and treatment of disease. Now, obviously, I could back this up with lots of different specific examples, and I can think of some right away. For example, the understanding of anatomy was improved by Vesalius and his fabric of the human body. There was some modest progress in surgery because of the work of Pare and, for example, his gunshot ointment. And there was continuity in the understanding of the cause and treatment of disease because of people hanging on to things like the four humours. But as a brief summary, in one compound sentence, that's not a bad go. But would you agree with this view? It's really important to be able to compare the rate of progress across different periods, but also to recognise that progress is not necessarily consistent. Where things may move forward in some areas, they may stay stationary and continue in others. In rare cases, they might even go backwards. Anyway, that's the end of this lesson. It's also the very end of this particular part of the Medicine to Free Time course before we move on to the 19th century and more modern discoveries. But until next time, I hope that this lesson has been useful to you. If it has, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, good health.